Yep. Yay. Thank you. All right, once I get this up, sorry. Hold on. All right, I get to do this without notes, so I'll do my best. Um, all right, everybody, uh, thank you for all being here. Uh, my name is Robert Rowley. I work as a security researcher for TrustWave underneath the Spider Labs department. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, basically teaching your WAF new tricks. Uh, WAF, obviously, for those of you who don't know, is a web application firewall. For those of you who don't know, maybe you're in the wrong talk. So foremost is a disclosure or a disclaimer. Uh, I wrote most of these scripts, and I'll admit, uh, while I was drinking. And I don't recommend you actually use them, uh, but they are valid. Like they work. Uh, most of this talk is going to be going over the basics of writing Lua scripts and basically customization for a web application firewall. It's something that I don't see a lot of people doing, and it's, and I'm going to show you exactly why it's really awesome when you do it this way. Uh, yeah, if you get fired, it's your own fault. I told you not to do this. And you can go on Twitter and say this guy's an asshole. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. Um, actually, I should also give a preposition. Uh, before I worked at Trustwave, I actually worked at a very large shared web hosting company. Uh, we, I helped, uh, basically, I, ma I managed their WAF for them across uh, 20,000 hosts and over 1 million websites were actually protected with this WAF. Uh, so it's, uh, that, that's my, like, I'm qualified, my qualifier of uh, being able to talk on this subject. If anybody has hosted more than, or handled the WAF for a larger environment, let's talk. But. Uh, the agenda is pretty simple. I'm going to go quickly over basically what's a WAF, how to write some basic rules, and give you a quick introduction to Lua, and I'm going to go show you some quick, easy scripts that you can write really quickly, and then I'm going to go show you the cool stuff, which is counterintelligence at the end. Basically, this is what I did where I worked to build uh, intelligence basically gathering uh, scripts that will give me a lot of information about what the attackers were doing and why, basically why they were doing it, what tools they were using. I was basically able to pull in a lot of their tools, and I'm, I'm going to give you some code here that will be able to show you how to pull in all the attackers' tools that they're using against your websites. Uh, foremost, though, is uh, as I mentioned, when I worked at DreamHost, it was a very large deployment. Uh, there's there's uh, 10, 20,000 different hosts, and each of them were running the WAF. Uh, it was kind of a pick or choose for the customers, but it was the WAF was on by default. So there's somewhere over in the line of like a million domains that the, these WAFs were actually running actively on. Uh, these WAFs were also running. Uh, uh, every single one of the rules that I wrote was running a custom script for logging and automation for these tasks. So uh, it's really surprising that, and it's very good, it's a very good surprise that Bond Security and Lua worked really well together and they were very efficient at what they did. This didn't cause any load, heavy load on the servers, didn't cause systems to go down. Uh, there's also a key thing you need to know, so I'm going to be talking about Mod Security specifically here. Uh, as well as the scripting language is Lua. So those of you who are familiar with mod security, you're going to get a little bored a little in the beginning. Uh, those of you not are going to learn something new. Uh, so let's go ahead and go ahead. Uh, mod security is basically what I see most people do is writing rules to block actions that they think are malicious, and that's it. 
Uh, I kind of like recommending actually logging the, the rules that you're blocking and then review those logs and then repeat. So most people pretty much stop at this uh, for, for usage of mod security or most WAFs. If they simply use that as a method to stop attackers and they think their job is done. They've checked off a box for their PCI compliance or something like that and that's it. Uh, but there's far more here. Uh, it also is good to note that mod security just a few months ago uh, just opened for IIS and Nginx, so you're not restricted to use it on the Apache platform. Uh, so mod security, but this is in beta right now. But if you want to, if you have an IIS server and you're curious about mod security, you've thought about you can't run it, you can actually run it on both these uh, platforms now. Uh, mod security is great. It gives you access to a lot of variables. Basically, you can look at all these variables about the information coming into a request from your website and or the, the response body that's going out from the website, and you can say, I want to block it for these reasons. Uh, I've highlighted, which you can't really see very well. Uh, the common ones are like arguments. These are like the these are the key value pairs that are passed along to, to a web application. Uh, the request URI, the request headers, the headers that the, the user is sending. You can even look at the response body saying, did the re request include something that looks a little bit like XSS and the response actually include the same information? You can do that for XSS protection. Uh, Inquiry string remote address. These are the most common ones, but there's there's lots of variables that you can actually touch on to and like look to use as a method to prevent attacks against your site. I'm going to show you a quick rule. This is a CVE 2011-485. Who knows how hash collisions work? Yeah, that was a fun one. It was, this is basically a denial of service that allowed, basically you could send a, a website a request with a bunch of variables, like those key value pairs, send them a whole bunch and they look like this. And you, you do some calculations to be able to guess the variables at the right intervals. And what, what will happen is uh, it'll make PHP cause memory exhaustion, CPU exhaustion, and, and crash your system for a very little amount of bandwidth. You can just make a handful of requests and boom, CPU spiked. Because it's trying to ca calculate these things. I'm not going to go into the variable, but. So this is actually fairly easy to, uh, to block via mod security. Anybody have an idea what to block? Nothing. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. So you can just say, oh, it's like rule at percent args which says number, basically says number of args, uh, arguments, these are the key value pairs that are sent along. And you say at greater than 100. This seems right. Who here has a website that sends more than 100 variables to, in order to function something? Nobody? Well, this is an interesting story I have with, uh, with drink, well, the place that I worked. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Uh, it turns out in large deployments of WAFs, when you have a very large customer base, you'll have a problem where some customers will love the rules. The majority, 99% of the customers will love the rules, but it's that goddamn 1% that they're going to ruin it for everybody. And they will say, well, that rule doesn't work for me. 100 variables is, I send that all the time on my website. Somehow their website required 100 variables to be set every, with every web request in order for it to function. So we had to go up to 1,000. Anybody here really know why you need 1,000 variables on a, on a website? Good. I, I, I think I'm, I'm in the right company. Uh, the answer is bad development. Uh, so this is actually a rule, like, like <laughs> yeah, the, the web, the, I mean, what type of web server are you on? How much memory do you have? But, so I'm going to go quickly now into uh, adding scripts. So that was just a neat little rule, like that's a basic rule, of, you know, here's how you stop things. Let me show you another real quick basic rule. Uh, this one basically says, you know, tech rule is uh, if the request header if uh, the, specifically the user agent string looks like PHP, it looks like open fucking question mark PHP, uh, I want you to deny it. Uh, who does, I might be wrong with this, but are there any browsers that actually openly tell the, the request that it's a PHP script? No, there's, there's none. You could actually do a whitelist here and just say, I only want to accept a request if the user agent looks like these handful of browsers that are valid. That's a little bit overly restrictive. Uh, but again, with back to large deployments, you have to be it, unfortunately, you have to be the blacklist mode, which is very inferior for security. Can't be the whitelist end. But uh, for this case, obviously, if somebody's user agent string, if the, what they're telling the website their browser is, looks like PHP, that's bad. Um, anybody here know specifically what type of attack this is? So this is actually a local file inclusion to execution attack, remote code execution. You, you can tell if you have a local file inclusion attack against a website and you can tell the local file inclusion to include and execute code from any file on the file system. Uh, what file is the user agent string written to with almost every web request? Anyway? 
the logs. So if you know the location of the logs, you can quickly and easily uh, you can quickly and easily tell it like go here and boom, uh, it will execute all the logs. Which for PHP means it just prints out all the logs until it e finds this little PHP bracket, and then it'll start executing PHP code. Uh, specific with Unix systems as well, Debian, Ubuntu, and such, uh, there's the proc file system. The proc file system will have a specialized file, which is located in the exact same location, slash proc, slash self, slash environ. And environ will include all of the local uh, variables that are set with that request. So again, you can, and that one's the same location. Uh, this one I saw a lot of. So in any case, we know that this is bad. They were trying to do something PHP. It might look like local file inclusion. Let's going to do some, let's do some special stuff. We know this guy's bad, so we're going to execute a script. So when this rule matches, at the end it does these two actions down here. This is all supposed to be on one line, but that's nuance. Uh, so we're going to deny the request, and then we're going to run this firewaller script. We call it dirty firewaller. Uh, for a quick intro to Lua, it, everything is object-oriented. Anybody who knows object-oriented programming, you already know how to program Lua. Uh, it's light, it's easy, it's very easy to implement into existing C-based code. Uh, it's just a few hooks that you put into the code, and then boom, now you can write Lua scripts that extend that code. So you can actually tell that code to stop what it's doing and just kind of run these, these uh, scripts. They're not really scripts, they're bytecode. But, uh, and it's available in a lot of other tools, uh, such as Nmap. Nmap scripting engine does all, is all Lua. Uh, Wireshark it includes a Lua extension. Uh, also, WoW, uh, World of Warcraft, that's where most people know it. Which sucks, because I'm like, yeah, I know why. I, every time I meet a Lua developer, I'm like, that's fucking awesome. And they're like, I program games. I'm like, I don't play games. I don't program. I don't do any, I don't, like, I don't program for games. I do it in the security field. Um, and very few people, I, I, I met very few Lua developers in the, in the security field, like in person. I don't know where to email them. But, so let's go back to that 30 firewaller script. This is basically what it looks like in the blue. Uh, the, what's highlighted here? Everyone, every, Every Lua script is going to have a function main. Basically, you have to enclose all your actions in the main function. Uh, here's how you uh, assign a local uh, variable. So you do a local variable named bad IP. Uh, you can do m.getbar is just a table that allows you to pull uh, the variable information for whatever you're requesting. So in this case, I'm going to grab the remote address. So I want to get the basically the IP address of the guy who made the request that looked like PHP something. I think that guy's up to no good. So then I'm going to do an os.execute, which is really dirty and scary. <laughs> But this is why everybody, anybody know here, everybody here should know why you shouldn't do this. But uh, you run OS out execute, and you basically run IP tables, uh, and then you basically drop all requests from that, from that basically to or from that IP address. Uh, this is fairly safe because it's hard to inject uh, non-IP addresses into a remote adder, but you can do it. <laughs> I know how to do it. Uh, it's a bad configuration, but and then uh, here's a, since that one's really nasty, uh, let's do this another way. Let's use HT access firewaller. HT access firewaller, same function main. Same local bad IP, all you do is now some file handles. So you open up the file handle, you create a file handle to open the file, you pass your HT access file for your website, you do it with an append plus, and then uh, write to it and just say add in a deny from this IP address. So now all web based requests will be denied. Uh, this is a little bit safer, uh, still risky, but I'll go into a better implementation of this at the end of it when I kind of pull things together. So that, yeah, just toss them back. So yeah, that's it. OS dot execute denial of service return, like the little bit iron cannon return fire. But uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, of course when you're testing it, then you'll denial of service yourself and <laughs> have fun. But so then now there's a, there's another method. Um, so there's, that was the exact method. Basically, that says when a rule matches, you want you to execute this code. Uh, you don't always want to do that. It doesn't give you a lot of like control over when you want to accept or deny things. So actually another uh, special rule set which is called inspect file. This inspect file is actually a special rule that's made like only for inspecting uploaded files or files that are related to your website. What this will do is basically take, the second rule will take the file temp names and basically ins uh, drop them all into inspect file uh, which is this uh, script that we're going to run which is called file inspector. And then if file inspector returns true it will deny it. If a file inspector returns false, it won't care. So this, uh, so this allows us to kind of do dynamic, you know, accepting or denying of, of traffic. In this case, very simple. Same function main, same assignment of variables. So you open up the file name in this case, uh, which is the file name is the, the value, which is an argument that's sent to main. Uh, and then basically while you read through the file, uh, if you do have a string match for a malicious or known malicious, like known bad string, uh, 
uh, it will return one. Return one will mean it returned true, and the request will be denied. Otherwise, if there's no return, it it will just presume that it failed, and there's no it, like it will accept the request. Uh, anybody can tell me right now that this is terrible, <laughs> but what's funny? Oh, I actually was supposed to go through this like that way. What's funny is Spider Labs uh, already made this awesome. That you can hook into Clam AV directly. So you can use Clam AV's engine to scan all of the your, the files that are uploaded on your website to find out if they're malicious or not. And this is all handled via mod security via a real extension that pulls in Clam AV data. Uh, so that works out way better. It's already been done, but again, this is just sort of an introduction. I'm trying to show you like the various cool things you can do. So, and there's a final one. You can actually you don't have to do the file match inspector uh, or the inspect file to match via a rule. You can actually use a sec rule script. If you notice the rules earlier, they're all uh, sec rule at the top. So this one would be sec rule script. This say so you will say uh, run this script, and if it returns true, I want you to deny it. If it returns false, I want you to you know let it go through. Simple idea here. What we're going to be doing here is same local git git bar, uh, and what we'll do is simply just read through a, a file of blacklist or malicious IP addresses. And if, the, if there's a match of the requesting IP address to this blacklist, we're going to block it. We're going to return one, which will mean to block. This works really well when you do uh, uh, combinations of things. So you can say, you actually chain things together to say, OK, only people, like if the request URI has the admin, basically some sort of something like admin in the string, uh, if they're accessing your admin section of your site, check the blacklist and or e.g. check the whitelist would be a better option here. And basically say, only these people. Via mod security, you can say, only these IP addresses can access this. Uh, again, this is neat, but I'm going to get into how it all ties together at the end. This can be done via HT access, much, many other easier ways. But um, in this case, also, uh, Spider Labs made it awesome again. Uh, I found this out as I like submitted my talk uh, to Ryan Barnett, who's the guy who runs mod security within Spider Labs, who's coincidentally my coworker. It's a different department, but uh, and he's like, "Yeah, we already did this, and it's awesome. Like, check out like IP match from file." It basically runs exactly what that script was and says if the IP if that IP exists in this file name, do a block or an accept. So now I'm going to get into the counterintelligence. Hopefully I went through everything pretty quickly enough. Uh, so counterintelligence is really where it gets fun. Uh, you can get a lot of information from what the attackers are doing against your websites. Uh, you can get, and even if you're if you, even if you don't care, uh, there's a lot of people out there that want that information. It's very valuable for them for their research. Uh, and post-attack, you'll be able to have lots more information as to what it may have happened uh, if you do more counterintelligence. And it's all passive. And like I mentioned in the beginning, Mod Security and Lua work very quickly and very efficiently. So it's surprising what you'll be able to get away with. You can pull uh, basically more data for logging. You can get more information about the live, inf live data on the attack. You get GYP information right off the bat so you'll know in your logs or in your reference manuals that exactly what country or what, it, what, what information the IP associated itself with. Uh, you can also do something I didn't mention here. You can do automated abuse complaints. So if you see an IP address attacking your host, you can just automatically shoot out an email to their ISP saying, you know, by the way, this guy hit my site 10,000 times today with known malicious act activity. Please do something about it. This is what I did at the web hosting company uh, that I used to work for. Uh, don't be disdained when you never get a response back. Uh, so because I sent out like about 100 abuse complaints a day. Uh, very, very accurate abuse complaints, and atypically never got a response. I'm going to, in my mind, I'm going to think that everything got taken down. But So this is an example of some of the graphs that I was able, or basically logs that I was able to plot to a graph. Uh, these are two basic attacks against a network. They're pretty easy uh, to, I mean, base, pretty easy to understand. Look, you got this E107, you got a Zen card. These are specific exploits. They're very generic, and they kind of go and teeter off. and. They kind of say this thing that I call like just a static background of attacks on the internet. Like everything is always going to be attacked. Keep in mind these are two specific attacks against spe like specific software. This isn't just generic attacks against the internet. This is targeted attacks against software. Open source software coincidental, known vulnerabilities in it. And then you can overlay things like, oh, I can see how much of a problem this, in this case, this is the, the green line is the Tim Thumb vulnerability that happened last year. Uh, you can see that how much of a problem it becomes, how much how, many, how much more interested in the Tintham vulnerability attackers are as opposed to a vulnerability in Zencart or your 107. And then, of course, this is expanded out about three more months. This is the PHP CGI vulnerability that happened. This was a vulnerability that would allow people to do uh, basically remote code execution, basically run PHP directly 
uh, P, the, you can drop PHP command line arguments via the URL screen, string. So via URI, you can just be like, oh, yeah, I just drop you into basically shell mode and start executing this code, start including these files or uh, denial services site, things like that. I mean, I can see exactly what happened here, which something interesting happened here is during uh, February, uh, it went crazy, as you can see in the red bar. And then it kind of got quiet until March or April. But anyways, this is, I mean, this is good information, which most people probably don't ever go back and look at with their web application firewall. All this information was pulled via web application firewall. It was just simply logging rules and potentially, potentially placing them and then pulling the data later. Uh, talking about pulling things from logs, uh, essentially logging, let's talk about RFI hunting. Uh, this is remote file inclusion hunting. These attacks are pretty simple. Basically, you can override, if you can override one of the variables as an include, that's an include variable in the code and say, instead of including this file, I'm going to give you this URL and the code happily downloads that URL and executes it, that, that's remote file inclusion. And this is an example of a generic remote file inclusion uh, line that you'll see in the logs. This is very easy to pull from the logs. Uh, you can pull back, you can get this out of your logs at a later point in time, but you have another problem with that is that if you're pulling it at a later point in time, that shell might have been taken down. So you won't actually get a copy of that shell when it was being used for the attack. So, and then it has this other problem of that if the attackers just use post variables instead of get variables, you won't ever know exactly what happened here in these logs. Mod security and Lua easily just ignore all these problems. This is a, this is a rule. That, uh, this, is, this is actually an active rule that I'm, I'm using on some of my honeypot sites. And by honeypot sites, they're just sites that I've had for five years that I was like, oh, I'm just going to throw these rules up to see if they work. Uh, remember, drunk. And turns out they worked. <laughs> I threw these up before TourCon. And I, looked, I just looked at the logs because I was curious. And boom, like they were just full of actual shells. I'm like, all right, I'm getting shells again. I'm collecting shells like Pokemon or a little girl on the beach. Uh, so the second rule here is simple. If the argument begins with HTTP, uh, I mean, that, that looks pretty bad for most, for most cases. Uh, I want you actually to allow the request, but execute this RFI logger script. And the RFI logger script basically pulls in all the inform uh, various information from the request and then uh, writes to this back, uh, basically this backdoor file. And then OS executes, uh, the w uh, basically runs wget to pull down that file that was the HTTP file. So here's the, right here is this if string match args value is HTTP. So basically if this argument had HTTP somewhere in it, uh, I want you to execute this little group of code which logs the request to the backdoor log file and then executes and downloads a copy of that backdoor at that exact time. And like I mentioned, it works. So here's an example of pretty much this is the, what I would call the dregs of the internet backdoor like malware scene. Uh, this is an obviously non-obfuscated code. Uh, it has, it has a comments on how to use it. It has uh, clear, uh, clearly it's called out and it has a version number which is funny. Uh, so obviously, I mean this is, there we go. Um, and like, you know, so this is one of them that I, I found, like, you can go, Senbon Crew, I guess you got a shout out, but you guys are idiots. Uh, and this is another one. Uh, it's the uh, response command one. I don't exactly know. This is HTML, literally. Like, this is like daddy's, uh, or like uh, PHP, like 24 hours, write your own shell code. So like, write your own RFI shell code. Uh, these are pretty basic and easy. And this is the majority of what I got was things like this. Uh, but similarly enough, the RFI logging script that I showed you totally works, and you can sit, sit there and grab it. Once you have these shell uh, copies of their source code for everything like that, you can start back, uh, basically reverse engineering them. If they, are, uh, if they are actually obfuscated, these are not. But there's more fun if you have to reverse engineer it. And then you can start looking at other things. Like you can look to see if there's a password requirement and start making new rules for password requirements. You can uh, basically use this. I use this uh, where I worked to build uh, rules for a scanning engine that would seek out and remove these malicious files from websites. And it works very easily. So, like, worm, like uh, worms like, uh, that propagate through their, their own websites. Uh, we didn't really focus on XSS stuff, like, that would, like, self-propagate. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, We got all their code for, we got handfuls of codes of things that would, like, run, executes, scans against other websites. And, yeah, in that case, it, these are barely much longer. Uh, if you are really interested in digging into it, like I get copies of not only tools that they use to attack other websites, but tools they use for uh, monetizing their methods. So phishing, co copies of phishing sites, copies of uh, like like spam bots, as well as uh, attempts. Basically, all the code that they were using, the OD, the quote unquote OD, not really, but basically all the attempts that they'd make to try to get root on the box after compromising it with one of these. 
We reckon it too, if you got one of these on your site, you're putting your host at risk because then anybody can run and execute code. If there's an ODA or something released for the site, your server, they can run that code and then potentially get root, which is where the big threat comes in. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I wanna do something here better than a blacklist. Right, I also wanna request, I don't wanna just deny everybody's requests that they come in just cause I know they're bad, uh, which is about this. I wanna say malicious request uh, comes in, I know it's malicious. The WAF script basically first captures the request and logs it, because that's good information. Two is I want to log that IP address. I'm going to log that IP address just like I did earlier with that blacklist.txt stuff. Uh, and then uh, the second one, the second request that comes in, ooh, my slide got a little funny. The second request basically goes in, to, uh, this is a, a, a normal request. This is any request on a website. And it always hits this WAF script. And there's one of two things that will happen. Either one, if it's an unknown host, I'm going to send an unobstructed response. I'm going to allow this to happen will continue going. Well, two, if it's a known malicious host, if that IP address from the requester shows up on that blacklist, instead of denying them, I'm gonna capture the request, and I'm gonna log all information regarding that request uh, a bit and into my logs and then review it later. What this will allow me to do now is that now that I know A, a malicious host, B, I know any connection that they attempted, uh, in the end, when I review that log, I'm gonna get all the information about every method of attack that they're using and now you can turn that around and use that for as counterintelligence so you can build either more rules to prevent and detect attacks and then, or you know, just basically make fun of them in public places. And then you'll end up, basically it snowballs and then you'll become basically an undefiable force of, of prevention of attacks against this website. But let's put it all together here. So we're gonna do that example again where the user agent string looks something like PHP. Sorry for the line breaks, these are two single lines. Uh, you're going to deny it, but you're going to send a status of 200. So the web server is going to say, okay, uh, like everything went fine with this request, but there's nothing here. And then, but the, in the back end, Apache and Mod Security are like, no, we're not doing anything with this. We're going to execute that same blacklist IP list, uh, that Lua script, uh, which will basically put that IP address into a, into a file. And then another rule, these are related, but not directly related. Another rule is that if that, if that IP address of the requester is ever found again, we're going to execute Basically, you're going to do the same thing. We're going to deny the request, but we're going to send it 200 like everything's okay. And then we're going to run uberlogger, which is just this script that I wrote that does lots of logging. Basically pulls in all the data uh, from that request. Uh, this is the blacklist.ip. Blacklist IP, this basically opens a file, writes to the file the IP address. That's it. So if that first rule matched, where it says the user agent string looks like PHP, write, to a, write their IP address to this blacklist file. Second, uh, second rule IP matches, so if that IP address of the requester is in the blacklist, run all this code. Uh, the gist of this uh, is up here is assigning variables. Down here are a couple of for loops to basically pull every list of the header, uh, basically all the header request header information, and in this case all the argument strings, including post argument strings. And then open this uberlog file and then write to the uberlog string. This is, uh, this will give you a lot more information than a standard Apache log. It will give you shit like this. Uh, so an IP address, the request, boom, request header. Here's a user agent. Uh, and this is me actually running Nmap scripting engine against my, my own website, just to see if it would work. And, uh, and then here's a list of the arguments, and these would be, uh, here's host IP address, connection type, uh, and things like that. You can get a lot more. I didn't do uh, the GeoIP information. I didn't do the current who is information, and I didn't do like all applicable like resource polling in this case. I just wanted to write it quickly together, and if I had done all that, you wouldn't be able to read it on the screen except for everybody here in the first three rows. Uh, and that would be pretty much it. The Uber log and the copy of the shells I'm gonna be putting up on uh, basically all this code, and but a copy of all the shells are gonna be put up on my GitLab or GitHub account. Uh, so you wanna pull from, from there. Uh, here's a good list of information if anybody's curious about doing a little bit more complex attacks or basically more, more coding with this. Uh, that's it, any questions or concerns? Besides this asshole in the front? <laughs> All right, what's up, Viz? Does mod security exist on the ARM platform? It's a uh, Apache module. I don't think it will. I don't think it's explicitly coded for ARM. I do not know. Are you trying to write it for a small device? Uh, Dang yes. Yeah. Pineapple mm. uh, running nginx. Uh, one of the things that me and my other little cohorts have been trying to figure out how to get are post arguments. And you oh, just yeah. explain how to do it. Yeah. Um, I'll look into it. I'll email you. Just curious. Yeah. I don't know offhand. I don't, ex I don't, I don't, I'm not going to think that it is. 
because I think the Apache module is not written in for that language. But yeah. Performance problems with the rule sets at the volume of large web hosting company? I was, yeah, so the question is like, was there any concern about like, uh, what, basically resource tor torrents, attacks, things like that? Well, are you slowing down the web server? Am I slowing down the web server? Yeah, like I mentioned, I was pleasantly surprised that with as, as many crazy scripts as I'd written uh, when I was at that hosting company, any scripts that I wrote never had a problem. I did take special precautions. I was very cautious with what I did. I, uh, the logging was, the majority of the requirement for, especially logging, because there was a lot of data to log and attacks. Uh, I think I was generating a few gigs per month, just like, here's more logs, here's more logs. I think it was like millions of requests per month. It, on average, it was 100,000 to 200,000 per day of uh, requests that were logged. Uh, but, so there was a lot of intention that I did to prevent uh, excessive logging. So a lot of the logic, actually I took all the logging out of the, re the, ba the basic logger, because there was actually a logging function in mod security. I took all that out and I put into a script because I want to do a lot of conditionals at whether or not to log. Questions? In the back, I'm not going to hear you. So when you were collecting files, uh, do you have a size limit on how big files you're collecting? That's a great one, yeah. It, so the question was like, you have a size limit on the files that you collect. This is why I say don't run, don't run my scripts. <laughs> There's also a denial of service in this. You can create it to, uh, in a loop. Uh, you just, I uh, have, you can fix all those. You can easily write in the, the, the code to prevent a loop in it or, and or implement the code that only uh, writes uh, certain si file sizes for the files that you're downloading. But yeah, you could denial service the scripts that I have running in, in if you're clever. Uh, oh yeah, oh totally. <laughs> That's why I say don't run this code. But, but simply enough that uh, they go upload fixes to my GitHub, I'll be happy. Otherwise, eventually, after you pwn my server, I'll have to go write the fix and then upload it to my GitHub. But, but yeah, there, there's a lot of ways around it. I'm not necessarily saying it. The majority of this is like, here's an introduction. There's so much more that you can do with a WAF than just lo uh, block, log, review. Like, you can simply go, and nobody does really review, but you can block, log, do automated, ta automated responses, uh, attack responses. Uh, some of the things that I wrote these scripts for when I was working for the web hosting company was for notifications of potentially compromised customers. So when I, so I pull in and I get the passwords that the attackers were using uh, for their back doors, and then I'd listen for people that are used sending that argument as a password. They see an argument key value match pair, was simple rule to write, and I'd log it, and then I'd review those logs every couple of days, and I'd get a list of customers that have compromised servers, or basically compromised websites, and send them an email real quick saying, hey, I know your site got compromised, it really sucks, and like, let's work on getting it cleaned up. The, oh, the, the mod security rules actually it doesn't include that. Uh, you should be writing your own rules or enroll implementing these with existing rule sets. Uh, but I can give those as examples. I really don't, I, I, I fear giving those as examples will have people just running it blindly thinking everything's good. Reality is like they're like gonna call me out for getting why they got com There are tons of good sources of published rule sets for mod security. Uh, mod security, there is Scott Root rule, rule sets. There's the core rule sets that are shipped along with it, uh, and a few other paid rule sets that, you know, if you want to put into it. Uh, I should actually give a pimp for uh, mod security. The guys that run the mod security team actually have a paid rule set. It's the corporate or enterprise rule set where they'll give you basically regular updates so you don't have to pay an employee to do it for your, your purposes. Uh, the core rule sets are a group of very generic, very good, solid rule sets that are based on OWASP top 10 and like, those basically, it's based on those to prevent those generic attacks. The, the paid rule sets that you'll find and the good rule sets that you're gonna find are gonna be targeted for the software to prevent attacks against that specific software. Good, good. All right, oh, well, I think that's it for questions. And I think I'm early, so everybody can get lunch early. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, I have a question. Are you guys hungry? Yeah. Okay, the food's over there, or at least we'll be there in, in uh, any minute. Uh, we'll resume on schedule, so, uh, you know, you have the schedule, you know what to do. It's all right.